In this screencast, we're going to have a brief introduction to the evaluation and measurement of performance. We're going to look at segment reporting, return on investment, and the calculation of residual income. The focus on this chapter is the relationship between management incentives and the measures used to provide those incentives. In this brief look at segment reporting, we start off with a combined entity called constant, which has two divisions, the N division and the Granby division. We're going to use contribution margin formatting, and you can see that we break down the contribution margin for the firm as a whole into contribution margins for the N entity and the Granby entity. Notice that fixed costs are divided between fixed costs that are traceable to the individual divisions, which allow us to calculate the segment margin, and fixed costs which are common to the entity as a whole. These fixed costs are kept separate and are used to calculate net income for the company. The most important thing here is that the managers of each of the divisions are held accountable for things that they can control and not held accountable for things that are beyond their control. That is why the common fixed costs are not allocated to the individual divisions but are held back and charged to the entity as a whole. One summary measure of divisional performance is return on investment. This is defined as net operating income divided by average operating assets. The point of a return on investment calculation is to determine how efficiently the assets available to a manager are being used. It is often useful to decompose the return on investment into a portion which is called the margin, which is net operating income over sales, and a portion that is called the turnover, sales over average operating assets. The value of this decomposition is that it allows return on investment to be mapped into strategic initiatives of the firm. For example, some firms would have high margins and relatively low turnovers, and that would be consistent with a company that offers a differentiated product. On the other hand, a company that earns profits from a cost leadership strategy would expect to have a lower margin and a higher turnover. In this example, we want to consider whether a division manager will undertake a potentially profitable investment. The main concern here is not with the calculation of whether or not the investment is profitable, but rather, does the manager have an incentive to undertake a profitable investment? So this is not a question so much of what the manager should do, but rather a question of what the manager will do. In this slide, we try to anticipate what the manager will do. Currently, the manager is earning an 18.6% return on investment, and we can see the calculation here. On the other hand, if the new project is undertaken, a revised return on investment will lead to a decrease of ROI from 18.6% to 16.4%. If we expand those calculations over the life of the project, we see the pattern where in the first three periods the return on investment is less than it currently is. The return on investment increases over the second half of the useful life of the new investment. The problem, of course, is what will the manager do? Do they have the incentives to accept this investment or will they reject it? If we calculate the net present value of the investment, we see that this is positive, even using the 14% discount rate. So we know what the manager should do. The question is, will the manager actually undertake the investment if it lowers their reported ROI? The question, of course, depends on what the manager's incentives are and whether ROI is being used to 
evaluate the performance of the manager. So as you can see, this example was really cooked up to show that while ROI can be a useful measure of performance, it may be dysfunctional in that if managers focus on ROI, they may choose to not undertake positive NPV projects. An alternative to ROI calculations are residual income calculations defined as earnings before interest and taxes minus average operating assets times the required return. The definitions of these amounts are given on the slide and are very similar to the ones used to calculate ROI. We can think of the residual income as normalized earnings, that is, earnings which have been scaled for the amount of investment available to the manager. We will now take a look at the same problem, but rather than assuming the manager is being evaluated using ROI, we'll now assume the manager is being evaluated using residual income. And of course, the key question then is, does residual income have better incentive properties than ROI? Since residual income is not as commonly used, let's first take a look at how it's calculated. So we take the net income, as currently stated, as $820, and we scale that by the assets available to the manager times the required return of 14%. If we do this calculation, we see the current residual income is equal to $204. Let's now consider the residual income if the new project is accepted. We start off with the net income as is, add the additional cash flow, subtract out the depreciation, which are assumed to be the only accrued expenses, and subtract from this the new net amount of the investment, which is $4,400 as originally stated, plus 1,500 added. Multiply all that by 14%, then accomplish the subtraction, and we see the residual income is $144. So the new investment actually lowers the residual income in the current period. So in a sense, the residual income didn't solve the current problem. However, if we look at the pattern over the life of the project, we see that the residual income is only reduced for two periods and yet is higher for the remaining three periods. If you remember, ROI was reduced for three periods and then increased only for years four, five, and six. So there is some evidence here that the residual income might lead one towards a better outcome in the sense that it doesn't seem to penalize the manager for as long a period of time. But of course, this will depend on the particular numbers of an example. While we're not going to get into this too much in the lecture, it's interesting to note that while the net present value of the discounted cash flows was 55, it also turns out that the discounted residual income numbers also sum up to 55. Notice here that we don't subtract off the original investment at the beginning, but only work with the net income for the remaining periods. Proof of why this holds are available in the literature, but we don't need to know this at the moment. What is interesting, of course, is that the residual income is based on an accounting number and doesn't require that we transform the earnings number into a cash flow number in order to come up with a correct net present value rule. Also of interest is that we can actually use the discounted residual incomes in order to calculate the net present value. And this would also lead to a correct decision, assuming that the manager's incentives lead to a discounting of the future residual incomes.